So hello, podcast world, and thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to share a recent five-star review we had on Apple Podcasts from one of our listeners, Cross2712. This review brought a very big smile to my face, and here is the review. I love listening to this podcast. I really enjoy the conversations and how they talk to professionals about clear jobs. I'm a transitioning service member with the Clarence, and this podcast has definitely helped me think about the whole process and how daunting it is. I am a binge listener and loving all the helpful tips, tricks, and honest upfront conversations with talent managers. Wow, thank you. I think this is really great. I really appreciate that review. If you're enjoying the show, please rate and review us. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, rate us. And if you're listening on Spotify, please rate us as well, because we're looking for all those five-star ratings to share with everyone else. Today, we have another one of our special episodes with our dear friend, Tony Kuhn, Managing Partner at Tully Rickney PLLC. Tony is well-versed in many issues on security clearances, and today's episode is focusing on security clearance issues relating to foreign influence and foreign preference. Tony has lots of experience in help, helping cleared personnel navigate security clearance suspensions and revocations. I can never say that. <laughs> Security clearance, suspensions, and revocations, there we go, appeals to the discharge review boards, boards for correction and military reviews, plus a lot more. And I just always love talking to you, Tony. Always a pleasure. So you're a regular guest. It's good to have you back. So let's really dig into this because I, I just love hearing what you're talking about. So start walking us through Security clear Clearance Adjudicative guidelines B and C. You got it. Um, and thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. Uh, so as many people know, there's there's 13 different adjudicative guidelines and those guidelines are uh, matched up to an individual's information to determine whether that individual uh, should get a security clearance or whether it's consistent with national interest to grant that clearance. And two of the guidelines that often get lumped together uh, and can sometimes be misunderstood are guidelines B and C. They both deal with foreign interaction, uh, foreign contacts, things of that nature. But uh, there's there's a way to differentiate between the two that I hope I can explain today that will make a little bit of sense for uh, anybody who's watching this or listening to this. So for guideline B, uh, that, that deals with foreign influence. And the question is whether your allegiances, your, your allegiance might be divided between the United States and China or Russia or another country. Um, and guideline C deals with foreign preference. So instead of looking at whether your allegiance might be divided, uh, what they're looking at here is whether there's a conflict of interest. So should the United States ex expect you to resolve a conflict of interest in favor of the United States over another country or vice versa? And uh, that will be considered when they're looking at whether or not to grant the security clearance. So we'll talk about guideline B uh, for a little bit, and then we'll talk about C, and then maybe talk about um, at least one case where we've where both have come into play. Uh, so when you're dealing with guideline B, you're looking at an individual's foreign contacts, you're looking at their ties to foreign businesses, their ties to foreign property or foreign property interests, things like that. Um, and the question is whether those things can be leveraged to manipulate an individual um, to try to get an individual to provide classified information or to leak secrets uh, because of their ties to those foreign properties, those foreign business interests. Um, things of that nature, or whether an individual can even be pressured because they own so much property in another country or they have those strong business ties. Um, now, one of the questions that always comes up is, does it matter which country? And it does. Uh, obviously, uh, ties to Canada or ties to the UK or something like that aren't going to be as significant or as much of a concern as ties to China, Russia, uh, countries in the Middle East. Um, there, are, there are countries that uh, obviously, the, the United States government is more concerned about um, and then countries that they're less concerned about. So that will be taken into consideration when considering a guideline B and a guideline C issue. Um, the nature of the relationship is important. So when you look at attempting to mitigate the concerns, you'll want to talk about the nature of the relationship. Is it a relationship that you have because you have a family tie to somebody and your contact with them isn't all that frequent? Is it a relationship that you have because it's a requirement of your job and you work for the United States government or something like that? Um, you know, those are different types of uh, mitigation that you could use. And again, 
under guideline B, you're trying to show that you can't be influenced. So that's where the foreign influence comes from. Nobody is influencing you. Now, that's important because when we look at guideline C, instead of looking at whether you can be influenced, they're looking at whether you prefer another country over the United States. So that's the big difference mm -hmm. between guideline B and guideline C. Um, and again, they get lumped together a lot. And I think in, even in decision letters, sometimes they get lumped together and um, they're very similar. And a lot of the mitigation is the same. And a lot of the concerns are the same. Um, but again, the question here is going to be, is an individual showing preference for another country over the United States? And one of the things that are going to be looked at is finances again, uh, but just in a different context. So are you more financially invested in another country than you are in the United States? Uh, if so, mm -hmm. then it might appear as though you prefer that country over the United States and that you might resolve a conflict of interest in favor of that other country over the United States. And then another common question that we get under guideline C, if you were wondering whether this one fell under B or C, it tends to fall under C, is are you a dual citizen? So the reason that mm -hmm. is relevant, and we get this question a lot, I'm sure you get this question a lot, uh, are you a dual citizen? And if you are, should the government be concerned about that? Should they believe that you're going to resolve conflicts of interest in favor of the other country over the United States? And there's a lot of different questions that have to be answered to determine uh, where they're going to come out on that. And one of the questions is, when, did you, when were you granted citizenship? Was it before or after you, you gained your security clearance here in the United States? If it was after, then it's going to be difficult to mitigate that concern. Uh, and then another question is, why were you granted citizenship in that other country? Did you apply for citizenship after you uh, got your security clearance because you wanted to go live in that other country? You want to vote in that other country? You want to do something in that other country? All of those would be a problem if you're attempting to keep your security clearance here in the United States. But if you gained citizenship because your parents passed citizenship down through their citizenship to a certain country, which happens in some circumstances, then it's less of a concern for the government. So the dual citizen question um, is always is always going to be there. Uh, just to be clear, this is a this is a you, you can find a million different answers to the question on the Internet. You don't have to renounce citizenship for another country to get a security clearance. That is not a requirement. What they're looking for is whether you express uh, a willingness to renounce citizenship to that second country. And if you at least express a willingness to do so if necessary, then under most circumstances, you know, depending on the country and depending on um, how you got citizenship, you can keep that dual citizenship and still get a security clearance as long as you have U.S. citizenship. Um, another question that comes up here with the citizenship is, are you attempting to conceal any of it? If you if you have a foreign passport or you have foreign citizenship and you attempt to conceal it, not only is that going to be a guideline E issue for personal conduct, but it's also going to be listed as a guideline C issue as well because it deals with concealing this type of information. Uh, and then finally, your travel. You don't ever want to travel through the United States on a foreign passport. Um, this is something that confuses even uh, department counsel occasionally and, and some adjudicators occasionally. The, the issue is whether you use that passport to travel to the United States. If you use a foreign passport to travel into the United States and you, ha and you own or possess a U.S. passport, you're showing preference for that foreign country over the United States. And that's going to be very difficult to overcome or to mitigate. Always, always interesting <laughs> to talk to you, and and I know that we can go on, but let's let's move on to one of my next questions. So, last year there were some reporting updates put into place that now require cleared contractors to report up front to their FSO, international travel, finances, relationships, and more. You touched on that, but let's sort of you know reiterate what those concerns on, and then we'll get to the really meaty thing that I know you want to talk about today. All right. Um, so seed three deals with reporting requirements. Uh, and if you hold a security clearance, you should familiarize yourself. S-E-A-D, and that is Security Executive Agent Directive number three. So there's a seed three, there's a seed four, there's there's more than just seed three, but you're, you're focusing on seed three. Seed three um, deals with your reporting requirements, and some new requirements have been added for reporting foreign contact. Um, some of the rules used to be different. If you were a government employee, uh, maybe you had to report things that you might not have had to report uh, if you were a contractor, uh, but that has all become 
um, stricter here uh, over the past couple of years. So the change started in 2021 and then was kind of pushed back to 2020, uh, 2022 um, when a new tool was implemented to track the many uh, submissions for foreign travel. So now any cleared individual is required to first seek pre-approval for foreign travel. Uh, that, that might not have been a requirement in all cases before, but now that is a requirement. So you must go to your FSO, your security office, uh, officer, and you must first seek uh, approval for any type of foreign travel. And you're supposed to do this at least 10 days before your foreign travel. Uh, there are some forms you would have to fill out. You will have to provide the itinerary. You'll have to provide the timeline uh, for your travel, uh, you know, the dates that you'll be leaving, the dates that you return, things of that nature. You'll have to provide passport information. Uh, and there are forms that are supposed to be completed. And there's now a tool that was created by DCSA that tracks that foreign travel and tracks these requests. And uh, there's more than a million, you know, security clearance holders across the country. And the concern initially for DCSA was to was uh, to deal with to be able to deal with that many requests because obviously there's millions in any given year. Um, so now they've created this new tool that was implemented in August of 2022 that allows the FSOs to then go in and input that information. Uh, using those forms and using that that information that's provided. And then there's also now a requirement for a debrief within five days of return from that foreign travel. Wow. The things have really changed. I, I know that these are things have been in process for a while, but wow, big changes. So we know that you're a big deal. Yeah, because we love talking to, but we also understand that you just litigated and won one of the leading cases for guideline B and C. So why don't you take a deep dive into that case? Because it touches on so many of the issues that you have been touching on in this conversation and help folks understand better how these guidelines sort of were tipped off and begin what happened to the individual and what in issues came up that caused, um, you know, mitigation to happen or that he needed to have mitigation to happen. He or she, I can't say right. if it was a he or she, sorry. Will do. <laughs> uh, so yeah, well, this was a, this was a case that dragged on quite a bit. Um, and there were a lot of uh, reasons for the government to be concerned. But before I get into that case, I just want to mention really quickly, um, I forgot to mention it before. Uh, we all know that we're now in this new era of continuous evaluation, CE. Um, and they're getting reports from Homeland Security when individuals travel, foreign, do foreign travel. So you're going out of the country, you're coming back into the country, there are reports created. So I just wanted to, to say it is important to make sure that you're uh, complying with these new requirements to seek that approval uh, for foreign travel because there's a, there's a really good possibility that your name is going to land on a list somewhere and they're going to check to see if you reported that information. It's going to be very easy to check if you reported that information using the new tools that exist. So make sure you report it. Otherwise, you could end up triggering CE and you could end up potentially losing your security clearance over it. Um, so now we'll get into the case. Uh, so this was a case. It's, it's now been uh, maybe a couple of years, but um, it's cited a lot in, in uh, security clearance decisions and it's cited a lot in um, written submissions, I'm sure. Uh, but this case involved an individual who was an officer for a foreign country in their military. Uh, and he came here to the United States at one point and uh, went through a training and, and got uh, it, it was a. Uh, kind of like a foreign exchange program um, like we do with students. Well, in certain circumstances, we might do that with military personnel and other individuals that we're looking to train and work with from other countries. Um, so this individual was on a program like that and worked with the with the U.S. military from the country that he came from and did that just for a short period of time, maybe a couple of years, and then went back home and eventually retired from his country's military. And when he did that, uh, he enjoyed his time so much here in the United States that he came back to the United States. And I should say this is a published opinion, so I'm not sharing any information that I shouldn't be sharing. Um, but he came back here to the United States and he brought his family with him. He's got um, a spouse and children and they all came back to the, United, to the United States. They relocated here permanently. So now you've got uh, a retired military officer from another country who obviously held clearances in that country um, through their military. And uh, he's now living in the United States and he wants to go back to work on uh, a project that he was on before he uh, went back and then um, retired and came back to the United States. So he was able to get back onto that project on, in, a, in a limited capacity. 
Um, there's certain types of clearances that are designed just for a specific project, and that's basically what he was doing. But it was time he became a U.S. citizen. His spouse, children all became U.S. citizens, and it was time for him to uh, apply for a security clearance, not just for that project, but an actual security clearance. Well, imagine his surprise when he applied for the security, security clearance to continue working the project that he was working, but now doing it as a U.S. citizen, and he was denied. So he was allowed to work the project as uh, a foreign national. He was allowed to work the project while waiting for citizenship. Uh, but then when he applied for his actual security clearance, which was required to do this job as a U.S. citizen, he was denied. Um, it, so we uh, we appealed. We did our response to the statement of reasons. And there were a lot of different concerns that you would expect the government to have. He's a, he's a member of a foreign military at some point. Uh, he's obviously expressed allegiance to that country. Uh, so you would expect that he would prefer that country over the United States. He's now collecting a pension from that country. So you're looking at influence. Can they? Should we expect his decisions to be influenced by the fact that he's collecting that pension from another country? He's got bank accounts in that country, which is an issue because now we're showing that we've got financial interests in that country. He owns property in a third country, um, which was just really purchased as kind of a vacation thing. Um, but he owns property in a third country. So now the, we're muddy in the waters a little bit with all these different issues. And the United States government has to determine whether it's clearly consistent with national interest to grant this individual a security clearance and give him, give him uh, access to our secrets. So uh, there, we're looking at foreign contacts. Uh, who does he know? Who does he deal with? This is a retired military officer, so he knows other military officers, high-ranking military officers, so that was an issue. Then you had to look at how often did they communicate, uh, and it wasn't that often, but there were some communications that took place. We were able to show that most of that was in his official capacity, which was good mitigation. Um, we were able to show that they were casual and infrequent, which is, again, good mitigation. Um, there, were, there were a lot of different things that we were able to show, but I think uh, where we made our strongest argument was just showing that he's expected to resolve, he should be expected to resolve conflicts of interest in favor of the United States over this other country. And there were reasons for that. Number one, he's now a U.S. citizen. He moved his entire family here. All of his kids stayed. They're all going to college across the United States. His spouse is here. She's a U.S. citizen. Uh, their jobs are here. Their investments were here. Their retirement account was now here, uh, still collecting a pension. But that money is coming from another country and being invested here in the United States. So being able to show that he's actually built up such a long and strong, uh, such a longstanding, strong relationship by the time we litigated this case with the United States that we should expect him to resolve conflicts of interest in favor of the United States over that other country. And it helped that the other country was the UK and not Russia or China or something like that. Um, so we go through the uh, written submission. We were unsuccessful with the written submission and it went to a hearing, which happens, especially in a case like this. Um, so we went to the hearing and we we eventually won at the hearing. Um, you know, we were able to argue all the things that I just went through and uh, actually show that he's really just going to be working the the position that he was working all along. But really, the the important thing was that we were able to show that he's he's here. He's here permanently. He wants to be a U.S. citizen and he wants to be part of what's going on in the United States, which is why he relocated here and brought his whole family with him when he retired. So we we're able to establish that um, we won at the hearing. And uh, Department Counsel appealed uh, the the decision, um, and I believe it was Chief Department Counsel appealed the decision, and we won again on appeal, uh, which was really big because most of the time when uh, Department Counsel appeals, it's very difficult to win those decisions because they appeal for a good reason, and it's just a difficult burden to overcome. Um, but in this case, we were able to establish the security clearance and overcome uh, both the issues of influence and show that he's not being influenced by this foreign government. And then um, preference by showing that he was uh, heavily invested here in the United States and that he and his family clearly prefer the United States over the UK. So we're able to work it out in the end. Wow. <laughs> How long did that take? <laughs> So from start to finish, um, these cases can take a long time. Luckily, this wasn't, you know, one of the more difficult intelligence agencies. This was just uh, a, the basic DOD uh, clearance. But it took well over a year uh, because you go through the different steps wow. in the process. And um, 
uh, you know, even we, we even had to do an appeal. So, I mean, we started with the uh, initial denial and a, a response to a statement of reasons all the way through the written appeal at the end. Um, but we were successful. We were able to establish the clearance. And, and I was excited that uh, he was able to keep it because he deserved it. Awesome. So now that we have sort of this background that you are a really big deal as far as this <laughs> is concerned, what are some of the key points that clear professionals should keep in mind when it comes to foreign influence or preference guidelines and their security clearance? And what are some of the common errors that a lot of people make? Uh, so, you know, do your best. I know it's it's easier said than done, but do your best to not get involved in a relationship, an intimate relationship or a close relationship with a foreign national. And again, that's easier said than done. Um, if you are in a foreign country and you are meeting these individuals and that's how you, you find yourself in that situation, um, then maybe there's a way to mitigate it and um, make everything work out. If you're there in your official capacity, but you met a foreign national in the country you were in and you became intimate, you know, that's not the end of the world. There's a, there's a decent chance, depending on the, the underlying facts and circumstances in the country that you're in, there's a decent chance you'll be able to keep your security clearance. But don't search out the opportunity to uh, start an intimate relationship with somebody in a, in a foreign country where the United States doesn't have a strong tie or a strong relationship. Um, if you seek out those opportunities, uh, say, you know, you go online, these dating apps, these dating sites, and you um, seek out uh, individuals from Russia or China or countries that the United States is obviously going to be concerned about, then that's going to create an issue for you. And you might be able to mitigate the concern, but it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough um, to mitigate that concern, especially the, the deeper you get into that relationship and the more invested you are. Um, if you're traveling more, you start to send money overseas, you start to do those types of things, you're showing preference, uh, you're creating an influence issue. So you're potentially violating both guidelines B and C, and it's going to be difficult to mitigate that concern. So um, try to limit your interaction with foreign nationals, uh, unless it's something that you're doing for your job in your in your official capacity, um, or it's casual, infrequent. You know, a, a lot of people will just list off every foreign contact they have on the SF-86. That's not even necessary. That's not a requirement. So the question is whether you um, or a cohabitant uh, have a close and or continuing contact with someone with whom you uh, are bound. And if you read the question all the way through, it's a two part question and they list out, you know, bound by uh, a, a number of different ways and it's not all inclusive, but you've got to have that close and or continuing contact and you have to be bound to that individual in some way. Um, and intimacy is one of the ways that you will be considered to be bound to that individual that's going to be considered a foreign contact, a, a close and continuing contact. And you're gonna have to mitigate the concerns around that one. So try not to put yourself in that position uh, is really the best advice I can give. And try not to, you know, send money and, and, and send, you know, uh, send support to foreign nationals. If you do that, you're going to create an issue and try to kind of divest yourself of all of the property interests. If you can afford to do that, divest yourself of the bank accounts, the property interests, things of that nature, and invest here in the United States and, and start to create a record of showing preference for the United States over the other country, whether it's a country that you moved here from or a country that you lived in for a job, whatever the circumstances, when you leave that country, try to separate yourself from that country, financially, property, uh, relationships, things of that nature, they're all going to, they're all going to come into play when the government's looking at you for a security, security clearance. Just a big kibosh on everyone's dating. I know. Come on. <laughs> You know, Valentine's Day is right around the corner and you're just putting a kibosh on, on all these romantic interests. I'm sorry. I'm ruining it for I know. everybody. <laughs> Don't ruin it. It's, it's okay. It's completely understandable. Well, Tony, thanks again for joining us. Totally, you know, enjoyable, very enlightening, and we look forward to having you come back on another show. Always a pleasure. If, one more thing that I, I did forget to mention, I just sure. want to touch on briefly. Um, there's a lot of questions about whether, they, whether an individual can travel to, say, Canada or Mexico. I live 10 minutes from the Canadian border and sometimes we'll go over there for the weekend. Um, in these new changes with the reporting requirements, it's not a big deal if you go there for a day trip, an unplanned day trip. You don't need pre-approval for an unplanned day trip to Canada or Mexico, but you're just supposed to report the travel within five days of returning. So not a big deal. Um, if you decide you want to go to Mexico or Canada for a day, 
Don't stop yourself from doing it. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Just make sure that you report it when you get back. Unplanned day trips only. Sounds great. Thanks again, Tony. Really appreciate it. Take care.